This is Joel Duff. Welcome back to the channel. And it's been a while since we had a hemoglobin challenge, but we have a new contestant. Yes, we have a new contestant for the hemoglobin challenge, and it's biology professor Carissa. She appeared recently on Sal Cordova's Evidence and Reasons Academy YouTube channel, where she was interviewed about her experiences as a professor at a small Christian college and how she came to be to become a young earth creationist. The primary reason she became a current young earth creationist, by the way, she attributes to the discovery of soft tissues in dinosaurs. That's the thing that convinced her that the world must be young. So she was a professor, uh, really probably a visiting professor for a, probably a one year contract. That's, far, that's I, I visited the small uh, college that she taught at in uh, it's a private uh, Christian college in Pennsylvania. Uh, and she doesn't appear to be there any longer. So I think it was a one year so basically teaching stint. And Sal Cordova is interviewing her again about uh, her experiences as a Christian professor. And she has a lot to say about soft tissues and dino DNA. So that's why my title here, Fresh Dino Tissues, because that's what convinced her of young earth creationism. And then she goes on to talk about DNA hopefully from permafrost preserved dinos. That's her dream is to find dinosaurs preserved in permafrost in Northern locations and be able to extract DNA from those fresh cells and to be able to show that dinosaurs are not birds. But before we go to the video, because what I'm gonna do is we're, we're gonna play a little clip uh, from that interview and talk about her misconceptions about dinosaur soft tissues or soft tissue preservation in general, because that's what the hemoglobin challenge is about. The hemoglobin challenge is about any time a creationist misappropriates or misunderstands the true nature of soft tissue preservation, giving the impression to the audience that fresh tissues, that like cells just recently were, that are part of organisms that recently died, are exposed and have been discovered in the fossil record. So just in a, in a nutshell, I want to I want to summarize what um, the the origins of the hemoglobin challenge are, because it, it specifically deals with the claim that hemoglobin or blood has been found in million year old fossils. And I want to point out that, yes, the remains of blood have been found, right? The decayed remains of blood have been found the remnants of biomolecules that are original to the original organism still are found in some fossils, giving us evidence that blood cells were there. But actual blood cells? We haven't found whole intact blood cells preserved for us in fossils that are, you know, millions of years old. What we do find is the remains of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a large macromolecule that's found inside of blood cells. You can see here I've had like on average 270, well, this for like a human being or for most mammals, 270 million hemoglobin molecules per blood cell. And each one of those hemoglobin molecules has 11,200 atoms. That is a really large molecule, right? And most of that is protein, right? Bunch of amino acids. So lots and lots of amino acids. Like there's sort of four subunits that then combine to form the entire hemoglobin molecule. But at the core of hemoglobin is another molecule, all right? Not, not, the, the, not, the, not amino acids, it's the heme unit. And there are four heme units in each hemoglobin macromolecule. And there's a, there's a picture of a heme unit right there, right? It's a cyclical aromatic um, carbon you know, molecule, organic molecule with the iron in the center. And of course, it's the iron that, you know, that's being transported by hemoglobin and what, what it's famous for. But then these other structures below here are things that that's what this becomes through the degradation process or the preservation process over time. What is found in fossils, including some dinosaur bones, are heme units, but not heme like this. All right, but the breakdown products of heme, so like porphyrin, all right? And porphyrin is this incredibly stable molecule, 
right? You have a rearrangement of the, the bonds holding out of the heme molecule to the point where it rearranges to the point where it becomes more and more stable over time. And then basically it's locked into place and not a lot of degradation happens. If not really, it can go millions and millions of years with no degradation happening at all to these molecules. Now, what is missing? All the amino acids, all right? <laughs> the, the amino acids of the hemoglobin are long gone, long decayed, and all you have left is the remains of the biodegraded, or what we'll call it, reconformed hemoglobin or heme molecule into these more stable units. And then when we look at that, right, we do a biochemical analysis of fossils, and we find that there are these breakdown products of heme. We don't say that we found the actual heme unit or the hemoglobin itself, right? It's not fresh hemoglobin. It's not the, the original biomolecule in its original condition. We say that we found porphyrin, and porphyrin is indicative of the prior presence of hemoglobin. Right, because it is, you know, we're inferring that hemoglobin broke down and left this molecule for us, which we can then use as an identifier that hemoglobin was once present there. But we're not actually seeing the hemoglobin itself. Young Earth creationists will often talk about, I mean, they'll straight up say that hemoglobin was found in fossils. And it was like, well, hemoglobin is this complex molecule. It's got lots of proteins. It's got amino acids. And how could those have survived for hundreds of millions of years? Well, they have it. <laughs> they, they have it. And if they are not telling their audience that, that is the hemoglobin challenge. The hemoglobin challenge is tell your audience what was found and what it represents, right? Because you're giving a false impression that complex molecules are being preserved for 65 million years in the way that you're presenting. Yes. Okay. That's a lot of background before we go to the video, but just keep this in mind when you're listening to Carissa talk about her impressions of why or why she finds soft tissue preservation so compelling and must require a younger interpretation. Um, I think theistic evolution was sort of always never an option. I don't know. I think it's because my dad told me why that was an issue for Christians to subscribe to that. And actually, Richard Dawkins himself doesn't think that being a theistic evolutionist makes any sense. So if he doesn't think it makes any sense, I don't think it makes any sense. Um, well, I mean, Richard Dawkins doesn't think Christianity makes any sense either. So is she going to throw Christianity out because Richard Dawkins doesn't think it makes any sense? I don't know. Using Richard Dawkins as your reason for not accepting theistic evolution is eh, a little iffy for me. <laughs> We're getting to the soft tissue stuff. Um, so, um, in terms of once I was at the California Academy of Sciences, um, that's when I got saved. Um, and that was because I got really sick with Clostridium difficile. So I really only, I wasn't a young earth creationist at that point. I became a young earth creationist when I started exploring dinosaur tissue cells and DNA. And I just could not fathom how, the, the, how well preserved dinosaur tissue was from fossils. In fact, Mary Schweitzer herself said um, that the, it, she could smell like something foul on the fossil. So it was very fresh, I would say very fresh tissue, uh, very fresh cells. And now I've heard this claim before that because Mary Schweitzer reported that she could smell something when she broke open the fossil, that this must indicate that these, this tissue that was inside of this bone must be fresh. Fresh as in, you know, a couple thousand years old. Couldn't be millions of years old. Um, I don't know how many fossils you've been around, but uh, I've been around a lot of rocks that have a lot of smells. And uh, there's often a lot of bacteria in these types of environments as well. The smell itself is, it's a nice little story that sounds like it's related to the actual materials inside of the bone itself. But that's not a like a scientific fact that these smells came from decaying tissue that was inside of this bone when it was broken open. Um, so that's a that's a pretty weak thing to go on to say like, oh, therefore it's fresh tissue. 
but this is a minor point. Let's continue. Later um, in 2020 and 2021, very recently, uh, she was successful at staining DNA inside um, bone cells and cartilage cells and uh, demonstrating, you know, that there was a a decent amount of DNA still in the nuclei of some of these uh, dinosaur cells. And she compared it to the cells of emus, ostriches, um, alligators, and uh, the staining was very similar. Now, of course, the amount of DNA was much less in the dinosaur than it was in the emu or ostrich or alligator, which were fresh, very fresh new cells. But it was just profound just how fresh the tissue cell, like the cells looked under the microscope from the dinosaur. They, I mean, they look just as fresh as the cells from the emu, ostrich, or alligator. So it's almost like there was no time that had gone by at all between those two specimens. Um, but the staining was still very pronounced. Uh, all right. So she's talking about fresh cells and she's referring to these cells look just like the cells from these other living organisms that were prepared to compare to these dinosaur cells for the staining, right? Looking like something and being the same thing are not the same, okay? You can look like something. You can have the morphological appearance of those cells. Remember, if you're in bone, you're surrounded by a, a crystal lattice structure, basically, and the cells are inside of there. So you eat away that other material, and whatever's been preserved in where the cell was is going to take on the shape of that cell. How do I know that red blood cells and these other kinds of um, uh, cartilage cells are not exactly the same as the cells that are found in ostriches or, or that are picked out of the ostriches? Because if they were, they would have plasma membranes. Right? They would have all kinds of other organic compounds that make up the plasma membrane or the cell wall. Well, not technically cell wall, but the wall, the outer surface right, of the cell giving it its appearance. That would be easy to chemically analyze and show that there was all these other different biomolecules. But those molecules aren't found. There are other structures that make up the appearance of that cell. Now, inside that cell, there may have been something there that represents where the DNA was in the nucleolus. And I don't know. I, I know Mary Schweitzer. I've talked to her briefly, and I respect her work. Um, and I know that a few others have been able to produce some kind of staining of something that looks like DNA in the center of these objects that look like preserved cells or modified cells. Preserving that DNA or staining that DNA doesn't mean that that DNA is fresh, though. It doesn't mean it's like the original DNA. The DNA can be broken way down. All you need to do is have uh, two bases or a chemical or the backbone, right, sugar phosphate backbone present in order for some of those stains to actually stick to that DNA. There's also the problem of bacterial contamination. Of course, bacteria have DNA in them, too. Um, I'm, I am relatively convinced that the bacterial contamination issue has been dealt with in some of the studies that looked at DNA staining. And so maybe there is some remnant, breakdown remnant of the DNA. Now, remember what I showed you about blood cells, right? Has blood our blood cells found? No. Remnants of hemoglobin are found. And only one aspect of the hemoglobin, which is this really, really um, stable molecule, that results from lots of chemical modification. The same thing could be happening to DNA. There could be certain segments of DNA with certain base pairs that then form a uh, secondary bonding, especially with the, again, with the iron molecules that then form highly stable molecular structures that then persist through long periods of time and potentially get stained. That's very different than thinking this is an organism that just died recently and you open it up and there's like fresh cells there and fresh tissue there. See, she's, she references tissue multiple times uh, in this paper, but, uh, or in this talk. But tissues are groups of cells, right? You know, in community, that's not something that is uh, seen in these uh, particular uh, fossils. 
All right, let's continue because she says one other interesting thing that I want to address. Uh, but again, it's just the amount. So she theorized that the amount was less because a lot of the DNA had uh, been degraded. But there was still a significant amount there to see. Um, so I, I did, I did have a, an email conversation with her about mitochondrial DNA, um, and looking at mitochondria and dinosaur cells. So I hope that she pursues that. I hope she goes after it. Um, because if I can't do it, I hope she does it. Um, I hope that you can see mitochondria and dinosaur cells. I hope that you can sequence mitochondrial DNA so you can you know, tell us what it is, like what it, how similar is it to all life that we know today? Uh, li- you know, all extant living organisms. How do, how do the dinosaurs fit into, you know? Just really quickly here. If there were, um, yeah, you know, there are a lot of mitochondria in cells, right? Each cell can have hundreds of mitochondria. So mitochondria is a good thing to go after if you're interested in finding DNA in an organism and lots of our ancient uh, DNA molecules that we have sequenced come from mitochondrial genomes from organisms simply because there's so many of them. So even though there's a lot of degradation, you're more likely to find uh, intact mitochondrial DNA. Um, but if mitochondria were present, right, and they should be readily visible, right? You should be able to use an electron microscope, you should be able to see here's a mitochondria in these tissues that have been found. And yet, I don't know of any reports of mitochondria being found. Right, they should be a little even more stable in the overall cell, all right, because they're double membrane bound molecules, and then they have their own DNA inside. Um, right, anytime somebody claims, Oh, we found cells, and those cells are fresh, well, if they're fresh, we have plenty of techniques in order to see inside those cells, identify organelles, to, to, uh, extract a bunch of different kinds of chemicals from those cells to do a variety of different types of methods of analyzing those chemicals and to reconstitute or sequence the lipids, the fats, the proteins, the and, and even see the carbohydrates that are present there. I right? should be able to take a little patch of this cell that's been found in, in there and simply run it through a bunch of sophisticated uh, equipment and be able to identify a whole suite of organic compounds and how they're related to other organisms that are present today. That should not be hard, in which case there are many labs that should have done that already. The fact that it hasn't been done suggests that that kind of detail, that kind of preservation doesn't exist. So if the only thing that is being preserved are collagen fibers, which are highly stable, form cross, cross-linking bonds, that stabilize them, and there's no reason chemically to believe that those chemi- those stabilized bonds can't survive for tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of years. And then you have porphyrins. Porphyrins are found in oil, by the way, and oil is a biomolecule, and nobody's thought that oil has to degrade within thousands of years. It can last hundreds of millions of years as well. So organic molecules can survive over long periods of time, but usually in certain stable states. Um, and so to claim that these are fresh tissues that are just 4,000 years old, if these bones were only 4,000 years old, and as she said uh, earlier, or maybe I haven't, haven't played that part yet, uh, where the mammoth has been sequenced, we'd sequence the whole genome of a mammoth. And if we wanted to, we could figure out all the biomolecules in a mammoth, like sequence the proteins and all that, because uh, uh, from 4,000-year-old mammoths because that material has survived that long. And yet these dinosaur bones are only 4,000 years old and we can't extract that kind of material from dinosaur bones. We get these, only get to see these extremely stable molecules. That is evidence in itself of their great age and antiquity, not of their youth. But she's gonna say something like, I have predicted and I have said that young earth creationists should say and they should research, Carissa is going to suggest it. And I really, I'm, I'm going to give her props for that. Let's see that. Um, you know, the diversity of life. Uh, of course, as a young earth creationist, I believe they're not going to be anything like the birds. Um, but I, I do want to encourage that if 
you have the funding to do this, you should do it and not be afraid to do it. Um, and who cares if you change the paradigm? Like, that's what we need. We need a paradigm shift. Um, Darwinism is collapsing. It's falling apart. Um, so I think we need a paradigm shift. And I think dinosaur DNA sequencing could help with that. So, I mean, she's right. Sequencing dinosaurs would uh, be really informative. It'd be great. I would love it if we could sequence dinosaur DNA. She fully expects that we should be able to sequence dinosaur DNA. Because after all, they're only 4,000 years old. And she also noted that she's convinced they won't be anything like birds. Right? Because, well, they're not birds. And they're not related to birds. So their DNA should be distinctly different and not look like it has any similarities uh, to birds. I would love to find dinosaur DNA and be able to actually address that type of question. But I'm saying that for a reason, because let's listen to what she has to say next. Is it is it fair to say that that began to incline you toward young earth creationism? That yes, because other... DNA has the propensity to break down very easily, yeah. um, especially when it's in these harsher um, environments where the, 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 the temperature's changing, you have radiation, you have erosion, you have water, all of these things that should just, like, how can it still be there if it's millions and millions of years old? And I, I don't buy the iron hypothesis of the iron preserving the cells because um, the experiment that they did was in a very controlled setting with a lot of blood. Um, and they're saying that the iron had that ability to preserve the tissue but the that was from the blood. Um, but the thing is, is you're not going to find those conditions in a fossil. So whatever experiment you set up is nothing like what is actually going to. OK, granted, it's not going to be identical you know, to to baby past uh, conditions. But actually, that experiment by Mary Schweitzer is is very informative. Um, and she's saying, well, you know, there's blood there. It's almost acting like, well, there, you know, there's blood there and that's different than you would have. No, that's exactly what you would have in that dinosaur bone, right? That's where, that's where the blood is being produced. There's going to be many blood cells there. And then if those bones, right, and you have this huge collagen and, um, and all the other bone, um, uh, material, right. And inside of that, you have living tissues right? These cells inside of your bones, right? Your bones are partly inorganic and partly organic, but that also makes them very, your bones a great protector against the outside environment. So a huge dinosaur bone gets preserved under a bunch of sediment, a low oxygen environment. What's inside that bone? Well, there's this blood. What's happening to the blood? It's breaking down, right? These blood cells are breaking down. What's it releasing? A whole bunch of hemoglobin. What did I just point out that hemoglobin has? Every single one of them has iron in it, right? Those iron molecules then facilitate the chemical transformation that occurs in the other molecules in that tissue, right? In those cells. And so that is the thing that's acting as a stabilizer, causing these transformations, uh, uh, these chemical modifications, changing the bond of some of these other molecules, allowing them to be preserved for long periods of time. It's a very reasonable hypothesis. And the experiment done was simply to show that, yes, you do get extended preservation of biomolecules in the presence of iron. And that is what you would expect to see in dinosaur bones. Happen inside that fossil chemically. So you may have made a point about iron radicals having the ability to preserve, uh, but that I don't, that's not those conditions are not found in the actual fossil itself. So you can't take your experiment in the lab and um, extrapolate it onto the actual fossil environment that that fossil was in for extended. Well, that sure is convenient. I mean, there is no experiment you know, <laughs> that you can take to 65 million years ago in those exact conditions. Right. So therefore, you can never show that that that, that, uh, that that's wrong. And uh, you know, and she should know that. It's a reasonable hypothesis. Shows that the potential is there. And the question just is, is how do some of these molecules get preserved for that long period of time? It's a reasonable mechanism to say that it is possible to preserve molecules for extended periods of time. The young earth creationist 
have to show that it's impossible for those molecules to be preserved, right? That's that's an equally difficult proposition in some ways. Like you can't do an experiment for 65 million years and say that it didn't happen. But you can't simply just claim that it's impossible to preserve those, especially when somebody has proposed a possible mechanism for that particular pres for that preservation. Um, and no one's saying that this is something that happens all the time. It only happens under particular rare conditions. The vast majority of dinosaur bones don't have this kind of preservation. So it suggests that there are rare events, places in time with just the right conditions that allowed for this type of preservation. That seems like a, a reasonable thing to propose for, for something that's extended over millions of years that the vast majority wouldn't because the basic uh, principle of decomposition would hold that under many conditions, most stuff would get decomposed, right? For the young earth creationist, it's the flip, it's the flip side. You know, in many ways you would expect because mammoths, we have many mammoth bones, um, and they have enormous amounts of DNA and collagen and actual cells, like cells with plasma membranes and, and proteins, which have thousands of amino acids still actually intact and you can sequence them. And we have those mammoths from back in the ice age and before the ice age. Well, in the biblical model, that's 4,000 years ago, if not like 4,200 years ago. All you have to do is extend back 200 more years to get to all the dinosaurs. Why is there such a huge difference between the dinosaurs showing very little preservation except for extremely rare and highly stable molecules and mammoths and many other fossils, horses. And I mean, we, we could list a whole bunch of stuff that's been looked at that's at least 4,000 years old, including human remains that are more than 4,000 years old that have thousands of biomolecules preserved in them, right? So it's the young earth creationist paradigm that has the bigger question to answer than the ancient earth uh, paradigm. Uh, but I'm going to play just a little bit more of this because it shows sort of the psychology uh, th that goes on with this, uh, this soft tissue stuff. How do you keep, how do you maintain these, these alpha, these peptide bonds for that long? Um, and, and, so I think, I think that there's DNA in there and it might be pretty messed up in terms of its structure and it might not even be sequenceable. Um, but the fact that we have a, a, a remnant of it from the DAPI staining and you can see it visually under a fluorescent microscope is very compelling. And I think from what I remember, um, the amount of DNA was comparable in terms of the, I think it was like three, I can't remember, but it was very, I can't remember the exact diameter, but it was very comparable to the amount of DNA that was seen in a woolly mammoth. Mm -hmm. uh, cell. And so that was interesting that the amount of DNA was similar between a woolly mammoth cell and a dinosaur cell, because they're supposed to be so drastically separated wow. in terms of time scales. Uh, but the amount you could see visually was. I don't really know what's going on there with the, with the size or the amount of DNA. I believe what she's referring to is the DAPI stain and the total amount of area coverage in terms of where the stain occurs. So like the Nico Ellis where, the, where you'd have a lot of uh, packing of chromatin, uh, DNA and protein. Um, and so you can get a rough estimate of the total size of the genome sometimes from staining of the, of the chromosomes uh, or of the, the DNA component of the chromosomes in cells. And so I think the indication here is that the genome size of the mammoth might have been similar to the genome size of the dinosaur. Now, why she would say, like, she finds that surprising, like, because there's such different types of organisms. Well, yeah, one's a reptile, one's a, uh, one's a mammal. Um, as if, like, do they have to have different genome sizes? I mean, does she know about different genome sizes? Genome size varies widely. There's, a, there's kind of a range among mammals. Um, but it overlaps completely with the range in reptiles. Amphibians have wildly uh, wild sizes from small to extremely large and, um, and insects and so forth. So there's lots of different sizes. But 
There's no reason why a mammoth and a dinosaur can't have a similar sized genome. So nothing shocking about that. But we've got the we got the main thing coming up here. So let me hit play again. It was very similar. So that suggested that, okay, if we could get it from woolly mammoths, maybe we can get it from dinosaurs. And the Chinese Academy of Sciences was supposed to explore this further. And I don't know why they stopped. Um, the only thing I can think is that the, the evolutionary biologists or the theistic evolutionists um, are very like concerned about the answer they're going to get um, from the DNA. Um, and so they're scared. And so, I mean, I don't know what to say. If you're scared about getting an answer, I just, you, you're a scientist, you should move forward. You, you've gone this far, so just keep going and don't be afraid. Yeah, obviously I'm shaking in my boots, all right? I'm scared to find out what dinosaur DNA might look like, all right? I, I'm afraid I'm going to need names here. I need, when I hear this type of thing about how scientists, and she even throws in theistic evolutionists, right? Christians who, who are, are working in fields of science um, are scared to find out certain results, right? Oh, look, there's, there's potentially some DNA there. We better not sequence that because we might undermine our own theory somehow. I don't, I, I don't know anyone that's going to, I know a lot of Christians in science. I don't know a single one of them that wouldn't jump at the chance of being able to sequence DNA, right? I mean, I would love to have a nature paper of me having sequenced dinosaur DNA and being the first person to really be able to definitively prove I've sequenced a portion of the genome of a dinosaur. No doubt about it. Whatever the result is, all right, I'm all for it, 100% for it. I need Carissa to name names. I need to know who's scared. She still makes it sound like all of them are scared, like we're all scared. We're all fearful, we're all shaking in our boots because we know that uh, we need to cover things up. It's exactly the opposite of that. Maybe it hasn't been done because it was apparent upon looking at close and closer inspection, there wasn't going to be any actual sequenceable DNA there. Again, the staining thing is not absolutely definitive in terms of the DNA presence, all right? There is the possibility that it's staining something else or staining a contaminant. I'm willing, and I actually would like to believe it's staining DNA. I really want it to be true, and I do believe it could be true because I do happen to believe that some very small pieces of DNA under certain conditions might survive for tens and hundreds of millions of years. Uh, Sal is right. The vast majority of DNA breaks down quite quickly. So tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I mean, we do have sequences from a million years ago. We have an entire horse genome from around 700,000 years that's preserved in permafrost under cold conditions. Um, and I, I am quite confident that we're going to sequence 50 million year old sequence that's just very, very short fragments. Um, Technology is getting better and our ability to repair old DNA and to sequence through uh, DNA mo or, or molecular uh, modifications is getting better. So I'm hopeful from a technological perspective and finding pristine fossils that we'll find a few things that we sequence. Um, but uh, to say that there is that biologists are scared to do that sequencing. No, many are chomping at the bit and there's many different labs that would absolutely love to sequence that stuff. I know of fossils that uh, we would love to know DNA sequences from like Homo naledi and so forth. Clearly, many scientists have attempted to sequence DNA from some of those and have failed because if they hadn't failed, they would be publishing their results whatever the DNA sequence is. Um, so I'm, I'm offended really by this particular statement that, you know, somehow scientists are scared um, and they are unwilling to pursue that truth. Uh, that just does not ring true for me at all. And in order to convince me it's true, you need to show me a scientist who is, who you can show is 
purposely hiding their results. Like they know they could sequence this and they're not doing it because they really don't want to unveil those results. Ah, I had a little problem in the editing. I realized that I forgot to turn the mic back on for the last part of that video. Uh, and so I've gone back, I've spliced it off, and there was one other thing that I was going to talk about in this video um, with respect to what Carissa had to say. Uh, and that was, she suggested that, you know, she kept on going on about the um, uh, finding mitochondrial DNA and that her hope and her desire is to find DNA from dinosaurs uh, in order to provide that final nail in the coffin of evolutionary theory, apparently, if, if they could find DNA from dinosaurs, somehow that would uh, prove that dinosaurs and birds aren't related. And she fully expects to be able to find dinosaur DNA. Why? Because, of course, dinosaurs were on the ark. Dinosaurs got off the ark. There was, what, 50, 60, 70 different kinds of dinosaurs times at least two of each one. So that's hundreds of animals that were on the ark, departed from the ark, and... She believes that some of those might have made it up to the um, the northern part of the world, kind of like what the mammoths did, and then got frozen in the Ice Age. And so since there's permafrost mammoths, there could be permafrost dinosaurs as well. And as soon as we find those, she fully expects we'll be able to sequence an entire dinosaur, just like we have sequenced a entire woolly mammoth and mastodon. Uh, and so I commend Carissa for taking the assumptions and the natural predictions that come out of young earth creationist theory and actually saying what should be done right that is i mean if young earth creationists are right that there were dinosaurs on the ark then we should at least find some bones left over from the remains of those dinosaurs that survived the ark somewhere and since 4,000 year old specimens we can sequence entire genomes from, and dinosaurs would only be 4,300, 4,400 years old at most, right? If Noah's Ark is 4,500 years old. So we should find good quality DNA in those dinosaur remains from those organisms that survived through um, the um, uh, through Noah's Ark. And I also think that uh, young Earth creationists uh, should proposed that uh, uh, when the world was covered with water and all these organisms got jumbled up and scattered, some of them would have ended up in very northern climates, which were probably immediately cold following the flood. And so they should have been trapped in ice, and that's only 4,500 years old, and there's no reason to believe we shouldn't have incredible soft tissue, actual tissues, like actual cells preserved for us. And so I think a prediction of young earth creationism is exactly the prediction that Chris is making is the prediction that all young earth Christians should be making and they should be sending missions, all right, all right, up to northern Canada and they should be seeking out fossils of dinosaurs and extracting DNA from them. Because that really would be truly revolutionary. I mean, that would make a huge impact. That would make a huge name for whatever creationist could do that. And going back to what Chris has said about how, well, I mean, you know, all other theistic evolutionists and all other deniers of a young earth are simply scared to find this evidence. I'm going to reemphasize, no, I mean, I would love to find that data. I think any paleontologist would be absolutely tickled to find a dinosaur bone with intact DNA that we could get legitimate DNA from. Uh, and if the creationists beat us to it, then more power to them. I think they should be spending an enormous amount of money on that particular research effort because it is a direct prediction of young earth creationism. They want that prediction to be fulfilled, the gold standard of good science, right? According to Nathan G Nathaniel Gene said, they should be putting their money where their mouth is. Carissa is actually interested in doing that research. More power to her. I'm glad she's interested in pursuing that particular uh, aspect of young earth creationism. Okay, that's it. That's it for the hemoglobin challenge. Uh, best to all of you. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.